Well, good morning, church. Oh, come on. Some of y'all need to wake up. Good morning, church. Come on, come on, come on. Hey, like Julian said, welcome to Student Takeover. We're taking over, but uh, we threw that old song in at the start to make you feel like you were in youth ministry again. Just to give you some context, there are people, 90% of my youth ministry was born after that song came out, so... Sweet Lord. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hey, if we've not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Taylor. I help oversee our student ministry, and I'm so glad that you are here. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm less glad, but I'm still glad you're here. Hey, I want to take a moment as we are celebrating today. Um, I want to welcome in our campuses. Can we welcome in Oro Valley, Santa Cruz? All the people who are watching online, I am so glad that you are here. Uh, can I tell you, student takeover doesn't just happen in this room, but it's happening over there as well, because this youth ministry doesn't just exist in a vacuum over here at Flowing Wells, but every single place that we put a campus, we want a thriving youth ministry to be a part of. Amen? Before I jump into the message, um, I'm excited for today, but I just feel a little bit, I just feel heaviness um, for the people of Israel. And what I'd love to do is because we are a church that prays. If you don't know what's going on, you can, you can read some news. But they, we just need to pray for the peace of Israel. Psalms 122.6 says, pray for the peace of Israel. So we're a praying church. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Can you stand to your feet again? Because we're going to pray. I know you're thinking like, oh, it's a student service. My knees just got settled. It's okay. It's going to be all right. The Lord's going to minister to that knee as you pray for his people. Amen. Would you pray with me right now? Jesus, right now, we just ask for the peace of Israel. God, as there is turmoil and unrest over there, God, Lord, we even just pray a covering. God, we pray a hedge of protection. God, a wall of protection around them. God, your word says that, that we have been grafted into the vine. So, God, we thank you for your chosen people. God, we pray for a blessing. God, I even pray for those who are on spiritual pilgrimage. God, going to see, going to, to, to see and touch the place. Places you've been. God, I pray a covering over them. And God, I just pray for solutions. God, I pray for things that don't make sense that can only happen through the presence of God and the prayer of the saints. God, we pray right now that you would minister to Israel. And God, I pray for an awareness, a revelation of who you are to come to the people of Israel, to not continue to look for the Messiah, but to see the Messiah Jesus in all of his, all of his beauty, all of his completeness. God, we love you. We thank you. And Jesus, we just give you all the glory. Glory and honor in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen. You can grab your seat and we're going to get started. Turn to your neighbor and say, We're getting started. Hey, before we continue, I do want to wish Pastor Waylon luck. He is running. He's almost, he finished. He finished his race. Good, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what he's hearing right now. No, he didn't die. I promise. He just ran his marathon race in Chicago. I just got to tell you, he's one of the only 50-plus-year-olds that can beat his 25-year-old son in a race, y'all. That's different. That's crazy. I will say I could beat him on the court, pickleball, play it down. I got you. So, <laughs> hey, I'm excited. P-Dub's proud of you, man. So proud of you, Dad. So um, before, we, before we jump in, I want to tell you the title of today's message, and the title is Take Your Vitamins. I know you're thinking that's an old, old jab. I'm not taking a shot. I'm talking about some Flintstones gummy vitamins. Come on now. Take your vitamins. Uh, I've heard that confession is good for the soul. Anybody heard that before? So I'm going to tell you. all Y'all promise not to tell anybody? Those online at campuses, you promise not to tell nobody? They're shaking their head. They're going to tell everybody. I got a story about some Flintstone gummy vitamins that I am not proud to tell you. But I'm going to tell you anyway. So when I was a kid, we grew up, I grew up in church and my parents encouraged me to fast. They were like, hey, you should fast something. And I, in my smart aleckness said, I'm going to fast homework. <laughs> didn't work. So kids don't try it. It doesn't work. I'm going to fast vegetables. <laughs> right. It doesn't work. 
It's got to be a sacrifice. And so my parents encouraged me. They're like, you should fast sweets, like give up candy. You should give up things like that, like things that are enjoyable to your taste buds and just eat a healthy, balanced diet. And I was like, ugh, for Jesus, I guess. Okay. But I found these in the medicine cabinet. And I just got to tell you, if you can't get the real thing, these are a great substitute to candy. I proceeded to eat more Flintstone gummy vitamins than I think anyone has ever eaten before in a three-week fast. Like, everyone else was like, man, this fast is so hard. I'm like, yeah, so hard. (laughs) And can I tell you, I think it's only the mercy of God that I didn't, like, overdose on multivitamins. I don't know if you can, but if you could, I probably would have. But God gave mercy and grace. And, and the reason why I, I bring these Flintstone gummy vitamins is because we as the capital C church, we as individuals are missing an essential vitamin. Me and you have a vitamin deficiency. You're like, yes, vitamin C. I need to get out and eat some oranges. No, hopefully no one has scurvy. Okay, stop it. But the vitamin you're missing out on is vitamin O. I don't think that's a vitamin. Maybe it is. I probably not. Vitamin O, I call it vitamin others. You need other people in your life. Even if you don't think so. All the wives just elbow your husband right now. Even if you don't think you need others, you need others. Someone say amen. Yeah, I I know all the people in groups are going to say amen the entire message, and the people not in groups are not going to say amen. So if you want to pretend you're in a group, say amen when we talk about groups. Uh, Y'all need others in your life, amen? Amen. And if you don't think so, I'm going to spend this next message, I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes telling you, showing you biblically and scientifically that you need others in your life. The reason I'm so passionate about this topic is because as a student's pastor, as a youth pastor, I spend a lot of time pastoring and coaching young people on how to build godly relationships. Can I tell you uh, the 12 to 25-year-old? Do I have any 12 to 25-year-olds in the room? Come on now. Come on now. Y'all need to make some noise. I know know you're lame. Y'all are supposed to be louder than that. The number one perceived need, the number one thing that the 12 to 25 year olds think they need is their social need. Not, this is crazy because I I can prove to you that you are no longer in this age bracket by how you respond. The best barbecue in the world or going to In-N-Out with your friends. If you're an adult, you're going to go, I need some barbecue. The the 12 year olds are all like, I'll eat McDonald's. I will eat stuff off the floor. But if my friends are there, right? It's the age old saying, right? If your friends would do it. And the teenager's like, yes. Doesn't matter what it is. I'm doing it. If my friends are doing it, I'm doing it. The number one perceived need of someone 12 to 25 is their social need. And here are the questions that, 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 that wrestle, that, that need elicits in them. Do I have friends? Am I liked by my peers? How do I fit? socially into the world around me and who are my people that I am deeply connected with. Um, One of the things that happens as we grow older is that we become lonelier. I'm anticipating a ton of amens there, okay? More than likely, the number of friends you had in junior high and high school has dwindled drastically. Hopefully, you're not still friends with your junior high friends. They just get you in trouble. Junior high friends just get you in trouble, And the reason why, the reason why I think this is normally a good thing is because as quantity goes down, quality should increase. But that's not always the case, is it? Often most of us believe that coming to church and seeing other believers is a good enough substitute for having deep, real relationship, and it's just purely not. I'd like to ask a question. I like response here. How many of y'all have ever struggled with a season or maybe a feeling of loneliness? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Those of you that don't have your hands raised, you are currently in a loneliness season because you're lying to yourself. (laughs) If you haven't yet felt lonely, just wait a little bit. It's coming. You're not going to feel understood. You're going to be misunderstood. There's going to be seasons where the closest friends are not going to be as close anymore. There will be betrayal because... That's life. 
And the reason why I share this with you is because I want to I want to spend some time talking about loneliness. Uh, S- S- Samaya Sam- Samia from the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology, and Neuroscience describes loneliness as this: loneliness results from the discrepancy between expected and actual social relationships. What this tells me, and you can leave that quote up for a little bit, what this tells me is that loneliness is not connected to how many people are around you. It's connected to your expectations of those around you. That means you can have three really tight-knit friends and you don't feel lonely, and you can have a million Instagram followers and still feel lonely. It's all about what we believe what we expect out of the relationships around us and what is actually happening. I know uh, all, the, all the wives in here are like, yeah, I expect, I, I expect my husband to pick up his socks. The actual case is, come on, ladies, say amen. Y'all need to say amen louder than that. I just lofted you a softball, slow pitch softball, crush that thing. Actual versus expected. What we desire our relationships to be versus the reality of the relationships around us. And, and before we continue in the message, I'd like to pray. One of the things that pastor preached on it recently was a hearing heart. And I believe we should approach every opportunity with the Lord with a hearing heart. Not just to approach it from the place of, oh man, let's just get through this. Hey, we got lunch. Hey, the game's on afterwards. I believe God has a plan for you today. Not a plan for the person next to you, not for next week, but right now God wants to speak to you. So can I pray, Jesus, give us a hearing heart. Help us not to miss what you're saying. Help us not to miss what you're doing today. Whether we're students, whether we're parents, whether we're grandparents, God, help us to hear what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Y'all ready to hear with your heart today? Y'all ready to hear with your heart today? Y'all ready to hear with your heart today? Okay. What if there was a way to unwind loneliness? Would y'all be interested in learning how to unwind loneliness? I know I would. If only to help the next generation. If only to help those who are struggling with social anxiety. If only to help the, the, the people around me. I'd love to learn. How do I help someone who's lonely, who feels separated from everyone else? And it's, there's a word for unwinding loneliness. We use this word all the time in children's development, in youth context, in, in babies, you know. Uh, it, the word is called socialization. Turn to your neighbor and say socialization. Socialization. Can I tell you, um, I, I, I have a, a little two, almost two-year-old. Where has time gone? And one of the things that I've learned is that the more she spends time with kids her age, other toddlers, the faster she starts to pick things up. Good and bad habits. Someone say amen. Right? I, I think my kid's the bad habit kid because the other day she was running around with the other pastor's kids. And I look and she's got one of the pastor's kids by the throat. I was like, whoa. And the worst part is no one can fire her because her grandpa's Pastor Whalen. So no, I'm just playing. She's playing. This plan. We discipline her, guys. She's normal. <laughs> Here's some of the impacts of socialization on different ages, okay? I think we know probably the first two pretty well, but I'd, I, I venture that as we get into some older age ranges, we'd go, wait, I didn't know that there were benefits to that for my life. Toddlers uh, or young children, it allows kids to build skills that will help them be confident and autonomous later in life. All the parents who want their kids to be autonomous one day said, Amen. Okay, when I say autonomous, that means you do your thing and you are a grown individual and you are no longer living in mom and dad's basement. Someone say amen. Amen. You want them to be autonomous later in life. Socialization will help children develop their self-esteem. Another word is confidence and build resilience towards the unknown and in turn create connections that make new social interactions less scary. Here's some of the effects as as they get into early elementary. They learn to foster empathy. They learn to improve language skills. Discover the concepts of sharing and teamwork. Y'all say amen. Some of y'all kids need to learn how to share. I've seen the kids department. It's like WWE in there. 
They learn how to share and, t- and teamwork, grow more confident, and get better prepared for school. Now we're going to jump into some teenagers. Y'all know they, they eat, sleep, breathe socialization. Teenagers with positive social connections are not only happier, but also physically healthier. Socialization is a big part. And now my favorite part, the effects socializing, socialization has on adults. Hello. Socializing not only staves off feelings of loneliness, but also it helps sharpen memory and cognitive skills. Remember how you can't forget your keys? Maybe how you forget your keys everywhere? I, I, I'm so guilty. I will wake my wife up at 5 a.m. be like, I can't find my wallet. And she lovingly never says anything mean. It, it, socializing also it helps sharpen memory and cognitive skills. It increases your sense of happiness and well-being and may even help you live longer. Socializing, this need, is most intense in the younger generation. All the parents said amen. It's most intense in the younger generation, but we as a church, as a people, as a society have believed a lie that our need for socializing goes away. Our need for others goes away as we age. Here's some verbiage that people who have minimized their need for socializing might use. You can elbow your neighbor if they've said this phrase before. So if somebody invited you to socialize, you might respond with this, and this might be your way of getting out of socializing. First one, I'm just too busy. Oh, I would love to. I just have a thing that day. I haven't told you the day yet. I'm I'm busy. (laughs) <laughs> My wife scheduled something. No, she didn't. The second one, I don't need anyone. I don't need anybody. No, nah, I don't need that. Now, nah, me and God are good. I don't need anybody else. I don't need anyone. Here's another one. I've been hurt before. Why would I go again? Man, I tried it in the past and I got hurt, so I don't want to do it anymore. Here's another phrase. No one would understand me. No one would understand my family or my past. Another phrase, there are weird people out there. The clapping people. There are weird people out there. I don't want to go to a group. What if they've got like, they're weird. What if they're a Cowboys fan? (laughs) Cardinals, Cardinals. There are weird people out there. I can't, I don't want to, I don't want to develop this relationship. I don't want to go out of my space. I just want it to just be my family and maybe one or two other people. And can I tell you, that is not a fresh life giving experience of relationship. Cause when you get mad at your spouse, you ain't got no friends. Dude, I'm leaving alone. One of the other phrases that people say is I've got this. I'm a man, I don't need no one. I got this. Can I tell you, no you don't. (laughs) Here's another thing people say. Making friends, joining the group, doing the thing, whatever the thing is that God has asked you to do, there can be a response like, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And I'm already overwhelmed. Can I tell you, Your need for others doesn't mean you're weak. I'm going to say it again because I think there needs to be a better amen from some wives who've got husbands who never talk to anybody, who bottle up emotion, or women who go to social media instead of talking with somebody. Hello. Your need for others doesn't mean you're weak. That need for others actually indicates you're working properly. Your need for others is what points out that you, my friend, are normal. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm normal. Turn to your other neighbor and say, they're a liar. (laughs) I want to jump into a passage of scripture that really highlights this for us. It's Hebrews 10.25. I'm going to turn there. um, And while you are turning there, I'm going to ask, how many of y'all brought your Bibles today to church? Come on now, come on now. 
And students, I normally tell the kids if they bring a physical Bible, they get to hit their friends with it. Y'all, I've never seen bigger Bibles in my life. I mean, kids be walking in on like with a, with a cart. I'm like, you need a cart for your Bible? One of my other phrases, and I, is there any students in the room today? Come on, y'all. Okay, I need you to help me finish this quote. I normally say this. The reason your life still sucks, it's because you don't take notes. God may be trying to teach you something, and you're like, I'm going to remember it. You don't even remember what you had for breakfast two days ago. How are you going to remember the deep uh, uh, revelation of what God is trying to show you in a church if you don't take notes? But hey, you just keep failing the tests that life presents to you like you did in school because you didn't take notes. But hey, 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 hey. Hebrews 10, 25. If you're there, say, I'm there. If you're not there, it will be up on the Sky Bible. It's a big, beautiful Sky Bible. Hebrews 10, 25 says this, and let us not neglect our meeting together. Look to your neighbor and say, meeting together. As some people do, but encourage one another, especially now. Someone say now. Turn to your neighbor and say now. Right? That is the cry of my heart, right? The cry of the Western civilization is now. I need my McDonald's now. I need the microwave to be done now. I want a husband. <laughs> y'all, y'all, y'all chuckle. You know it's true. <laughs> Hebrews ten twenty five. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Can I tell you, as I studied this passage, I've, I've been in church my entire life. This passage has classically been used to mean that you should come to church. Keep coming to church. Stop. Don't, don't quit meeting church. Keep, keep on coming. Don't forsake. Don't give up on going to church. But I actually began to dive deeper into the passage to learn what the writer of Hebrews is actually talking about. As I, as I began to study uh, church, when this was written, was not like this. There wasn't awesome, beautiful rows. There wasn't comfy seats, right? There wasn't stickers on the chair in front of you. Not everyone wore their best. They're, they didn't get dressed up. I mean, Cowboys fans don't ever get dressed up when they wear their jerseys, but. I see that Bijan, let's go. But one of the things, one of the things that, that happened at that church at that point in time is it wasn't like we experienced today. There wasn't cameras that I could juke out. All the people at the campuses are like, Ugh. just got sick. There wasn't, there wasn't all of this. What they met is they met in homes. They started in houses. Every single person had a part to play in the church. It wasn't like, hey, I'm going to come and sit and not talk to anybody and get out of here as soon as I possibly can. I have a part to play in the early church, and I am not advocating for all of you to go out and start home churches. Don't do it. What I am advocating is that God's initial plan, the start of the church as we know it, was through groups. And we've abandoned it. And can I tell you, I, I, I think this place has a part to play. The big service, I love the service. I'm a youth pastor. I think laser beams, I think smoke, I think rockets. I'm like, how can we melt people's faces off for Jesus? <laughs> True, Alex? I ask for lasers every time I get up on the platform. And he's like, dude, we don't have a laser certification guy. I'm like, oh, you don't need a certification. <laughs> I love the service. And there are things in the service that are very, very difficult to happen in a group. And there are things in a group that will almost never happen in a big service like this. Your story won't get heard here, but it will get heard there. Hey, the healing that needs to happen in your heart may happen here, but I promise it'll happen there. Some people in group said, amen. amen. Gathering in churches, it would have been in people's homes. It would have been community and relationship based. What happens in a group often won't happen in a large setting church service and vice versa. Can I tell you, you need both of those things to live a fulfilled Christian life. One without the other doesn't mean you're okay. Just because you go to church on Sunday doesn't mean you're killing it. 
And I'm proud of you for being here. But there is a second part. I started to think about vitamins. And the reason why these vitamins, I think, taste so delicious, I definitely took way more than the daily percent that I was supposed to take. And one of the things that I, love, that I think is so cool about vitamins is these are multivitamins. Hey, I can get all my vitamins in one spot, one location, one stop shop, right? Like, hey, just pop this bad boy back, you're good. But can I tell you, that's not the case when it comes to our walk with Jesus. This is not a one stop shop. You don't come here and get everything you need. And just because you have an abundance of one vitamin doesn't overcome your deficiency in another vitamin. Just because you come to church and you love service and you just, oh man, all I can do is come on Sundays and Wednesdays or maybe you come once a month and you're like, this is good. You still have a deficiency, ma'am. You still have a deficiency, sir. An abundance of one vitamin doesn't solve a deficiency in another. But as we jump back into that passage, could you guys put Hebrews 10, 25 back up? A deeper study of the words meeting together. Turn to your neighbor and say, meet together. It, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys a, a, a commentary, Barnes Notes on the Bible. And I want to show you what his study, his deep study found. It properly means, the phrase meeting together, it properly means an act of assembling or gathering together. Someone say, duh. Duh. But look at this, and is nowhere used in the New Testament in the sense of an assembly or the church. Nowhere else is this used to say, hey, y'all get together for church. He's saying you get together, but it's not a service. Hey, you get together, but it's not, it's not just like coming together and be like, we're going to do a prayer service and get out of here and we're going to have food. Like this is a different kind of phrase. It's nowhere used in the New Testament in the sense of an assembly or the church. The command then here is to meet together for the worship of God. You, by meeting together, I believe, are worshiping the Lord. Just the act of being around other believers, the Lord is pleased by it. He's he's not going, man, you guys don't sound like Pastor Nestor when he sings. Ugh. Man, you guys just like, no one like falls out and no one starts floating because the holiness in your group, God's just not pleased in it. I believe this, the context of this is that our sacrifice of getting together, because this is sacrifice to get together. Can I get an amen from some group leaders who clean their home, who get all the things ready, who like have to like keep their kids in order, right? They have to find childcare. They, it is a sacrifice to get together, but I believe the Lord is pleased with that sacrifice. We continue on in this, in this, in this commentary. And it is enjoined on Christians as an important duty to do it. It is implied also that there is blame or fault where this is neglected. There is blame or fault where this is neglected. What if there is a bigger, more spiritual, maybe even critical part to socializing to a group that we're missing? Not just hanging out and spending time together, but God receiving it as worship. Just like when we bring our tithe, just like when, when the worship says, hey, lift your hands, and that is an act of worship. The act of gathering together with other believers, I believe his worship is unto him. I preach this message because I spend a lot of time with Gen Z, as much millennials, they've all grown up, still live in their mom's basement, but... I love you, millennials. I spent a lot of time with Gen Z and, and now Gen Alpha, which is crazy. I feel like they're just running out of names and start coming up with things. But as I spend a lot of time when I coach, when I pastor, when I, when I, when I try and encourage, the number one thing that I find is that they're not listening to the words coming out of our mouths. They're looking to the actions of our lives and the fruit of those decisions. The reason why this is so important is because we often say phrases to the next generation, catchy things that we heard when we were teenagers, like, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. If you, if you do this, we, we give these antiquated phrases, cute sayings, and yet our lives model the opposite of what we're telling them to do. There's a hypocrisy 
to saying something and our lives look different from it. As I was praying for you today, um, the Lord gave me this phrase and I shared it with, with Pastor Dr. Deb. Today is the reflection of yesterday's friends. The life you are living today is directly connected to the friends of yesterday. And here's the thing, you're like, well, I didn't have any friends yesterday. (laughs) Thank you, point proven. Man, my life stinks today. Can I tell you, it's probably because of the friendships or the people you surrounded yourself with. Parents, hear me, your child is currently living in the fruit, the results of the friendships of the past. But can I tell you, so are you. The fruit of your life, the results of your life are directly connected to the friendships of yesterday. If you have no godly relationships, no wonder you are lonely. If you are leaning into friends that pull you away from God, no wonder you feel distant, like God is so far away. Maybe you struggle to make new friends because a close friend abandoned you. Me too. Yesterday, the friends of yesterday are showing today. Here's the next, the next question I'd like to ask with that. Today is the reflection of yesterday's friends. What do you want tomorrow to look like? What do you, what do you right now, sitting there listening to me, what do you want tomorrow to look like? The vitamin most of us are lacking is vitamin others. We need it to survive. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need it. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I need it. We need it to survive. We need others to not only survive, but I believe thrive in the life God has called us to live. There was a study, and I want to back up what I'm saying, uh, connecting it to science. There was a study conducted by Harvard beginning in 1938, and it's still being conducted. This study looked at people's lives and was seeking to find what patterns or consistent factors led to happy lives. How many of y'all want a happy life? Come on, y'all know the phrase, happy wife, happy life, happy home. I don't know what the rest is. I don't know. Still figuring that out. But we want happy lives, right? How many of y'all want happy lives for your children, for the next generation, for your grandkids, for the people around you, right? We want happy lives, amen? Amen. We desire those things, but one of the things that they found in this study was that it was not, someone say not, it was not career achievement. It was not how much everyone thought how awesome you were. It was not money. Oh, hello. If we as the church could get away from worshiping money and start worshiping Jesus, I think a whole lot would change. If, if what God told you to do was more important than making a little extra money, I think, I think there'd be some cool things that would happen in the church. The study found that it was not career achievement, money, exercise. I'm gonna say amen all by myself. It was not how yoked you are, how big your biceps are. It wasn't how much you could bench. The, the study has been going on for over 85 years. And check this out. It wasn't career achievement, money, exercise, or a healthy diet. Amen. I like some barbecue, yo. And the vegetables served with barbecue are not much vegetables anymore. The study found there was in career achievement, money, exercise, or a healthy diet. The most consistent finding we've learned through 85 years of study is positive relationships keep us happier, healthier, and help us live longer. And I'd like to add something to this. Positive, in parentheses, godly relationships keep us happier, healthier, and help us live longer. The best positive people you know love Jesus. I don't know what you're thinking. You're like, no, I know some positive people who don't love Jesus. Let's te- put them through the test of time then. Because the only consistent thing is pain and the goodness of God that I've found in life. Stock market up, stock market down. Housing market up, housing market down. Gas prices up, they don't ever go back down. <laughs> but the consistent things... There's pain, there's suffering, there's frustration. We live in a broken world. But I also know God is good. 
I also know that generation to generation, I can sit with my grandpa and my grandma and they tell me how good God was in their life. And I go, wait, the same God who did that is the same God who ministers to me? Positive, and I'll add godly relationships keep us happier, healthier, and help us live longer. The science and the word of God back up what I'm saying. But right now, wherever you're sitting, what do you believe? As you're wrestling, as you're navigating this, this is a hard message. It was a hard message to prepare. It's a hard message to preach. And I imagine it can be a difficult message to hear, but you are missing something. The reason I ask, what do you believe is, are you missing out on something? Are your kids or the next generation, the students in your life, missing out on something? Are you the hypocrite telling your friends, telling your kids to choose better friends while you have zero godly ones in your life? The reason I like to ask questions is because I want you to wrestle with this. I've settled it in my heart and I want you to wrestle with it. Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, man, I'm not gonna do that. Maybe, but I also know somebody might walk out of here and go, you know what, I'm gonna do that. And their life and their family and the generations after them will be changed forever. I like to ask questions, but I'd also like to encourage you to ask some questions. So I actually have a couple of slides that I wanna show you. And this is some questions parents you can ask the next generation, but as well, I think it'd be great for you to ask some of the peers in your life, maybe your spouse. I think the best way to probably grab this is a picture. Um, the, third, the third question just made all the parents or guardians in the room just pucker a little bit, get a little nervous. First question, who is the best godly influence in your life outside of your family? This is asking a student. Which area of your life do you feel most lonely in? And the third one, how am I, as a parent slash guardian, doing at modeling Jesus to you? I'm glad, Brandy's uh, enunciation, my daughter's enunciation isn't good enough for me to ask this question yet, because I don't know if I'm ready. And that's okay. It's okay to ask hard questions. The reason why I encourage you to ask these hard questions is because what I've found through, through years of student ministry is that kids are dying for mom and dad to have hard conversations so they know where they stand. They don't know what mom and dad really believe. Are we just doing this church thing because it's comfortable and it's easy and we just do it because we've always done it, but when I get to be an adult, I don't have to do it because you can't force me to? Or is there a deep, real, rooted reason for us to be doing this Jesus thing? They want to know. They want to have those hard conversations. The next slide is because I like to give ammunition to the, to the students or the kids in this room to ask some hard questions of mom and dad. Who is the best godly influence in your life outside of your family? When you feel lonely, who do you go to? I wrestled in asking what because most of us have really good hidden coping mechanisms. We call it Netflix. We call it Facebook. When we get lonely, we run to something or someone. The last question, when you were my age, who was your closest friend and why? Students want to know about your life. Whether their face shows it or not, can I get an amen? Teenagers' faces make you think they hate you and they really love you. Can I tell you these questions aren't meant to scare you but allow some very healthy and real conversations to happen in the place God designed them, the family. Those without students in your life, I'd also encourage you to ask and answer some of these questions. Who's the best godly influence in your life? Because I think the normal tendency is we would go, well, my pastor, Pastor Waylon, me too. He's my dad. We were to say, oh, my pastor, but I'd go, hey, does that spiritual leader in your life know what's going on? Do you have enough proximity to them? Do they really know, or can you pretend that everything is good? Finger guns, finger guns. Good to see you, pastor. God challenges us to not forsake gathering together. Don't do life without vitamin others. You will be deficient in an important area of your life. Going back to that phrase, 
today is the reflection of yesterday's friends. The thing that I think most of us would say is like, man, pastor, I wish I could go change yesterday's friends because they were jerks. Because they betrayed me. Because they, they did me dirty. They did me wrong. And while I know, I, I agree, I wish I could go back and change yesterday's friends, I can't. But the friendships I can't control are today's. Can I tell you, you get to choose the friendships today. Maybe you were hurt by friends in the past. Me too. Can I be vulnerable for a moment? Is that okay? I know my students are going to say yes. I grew up, my dad has been a pastor my entire life, and I've watched a lot of ministry. I've seen a lot of people in ministry. And for a long time, I watched my parents do ministry pretty lonely. Never really had a whole lot of friends over. My friends would come over, but my parents didn't have relationships. And I watched them way, that way on them. Now that's not the case. They've gotten so healthy. They got more friends than I do. But as a kid, I watched that and I started to believe that's how ministry works. I remember it was probably about three or four years ago. I was really hurt by some close friends. People who I thought were going to be here for life. People who been best friends with since I was 10. And I found myself telling my wife, I don't need anybody but you. And that's a really dangerous place to live because it's not true. And I remember about two years ago, some other pastors on staff began to just love on me even though I wasn't loving on them. I was just running. I was going to do my race. It wasn't because I opened up my chest and said, this is all the times I've been hurt. As I opened up, God began to heal my heart. Not because the specific need was getting met or because I I came and vomited all of my problems on these other guys. But because they would come in and see me. They would text me when they didn't have to text me. I began to open myself up. And I think after that, I've been a better pastor. I've been a better husband. And I've been a better dad. Not because. Not because these guys, they were older than me. They are older than me, smarter than me. Not as handsome as me. But those others, that vitamin others that I hadn't seen modeled. I got to receive. And can I tell you, the next generation, your sons, your daughters, the people around you, your uncle, your nieces, your nephews, your grandkids are looking at you and going, how do I do this? How do I do this life? If you don't have friends, then I guess I don't need friends. Man, if you're lonely, then I guess that's just what life is. Man, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, then I guess that's what we, they pick things up by watching how we live. I'd sworn off friends and the Lord helped me to become vulnerable. You get to choose the friends today. Can I encourage you? The action step of this message is not just to go home and talk in your family, but to go join a group. How many of y'all are already in groups right now? Come on now, so proud of you. Okay, those of you that are in groups, raise your hand again if it was scary for the very first time you went to a group. Because there's weird people. (laughs) I'm not asking you to not be nervous. I'm not asking you to not be 
afraid of that relationship. But I'm asking you to try. Join the group. In student ministry, we call them tribes. If you want your kid to be in a tribe, to be in a small group with other believers, encouraging them, pastoring them, being there for each other, and you're not in a group, join the group. Minister to that deficiency in your body. If you want your child to have godly friends, model it for them first. If you want your friend, your children to have godly friends, get some of your own. If you want to live a happier, healthier, and longer life, find godly friends. Hebrews 10, 25, closing with this says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now. I know in the scripture, there's not a pause there, but I'm pausing there and saying, especially now. Especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Here's how I'd like to close today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes across this place? If you're under the sound of my voice, maybe at a campus, maybe online, maybe in the room, and you'd say, Taylor, I don't have a relationship with Jesus doesn't matter how many how many groups you go to or how many services you attend if you don't have a relationship with Jesus you're missing the most important part none of these other parts will work unless you have Jesus as the savior of your life if all heads bowed all eyes closed this is a this is the most important part of service if you're here and you'd say, that's me, Pastor Taylor, would you pray for me? I used to have a relationship or I've never had a relationship with Jesus, but I want one today. If that's you, would you just be bold enough right, right now to just raise your hand all across this place? Those at a campus, online, just raise it up, raise it up. Just straight up in the air, straight up in the air, straight up in the air. So proud of you. I am so proud of you. Greatest decision I ever made was not who I married or what job I took is choosing Jesus. Those of you that put your hands up, you can put your hands down. I'd like to do this. Would you stand to your feet all across this place, every single person? And if you raised your hand, I'm gonna do something bold. I'm gonna count to three, and on the count of three, I want you to get out of your seat and come find somebody to pray with up here. Here's what I know. This room on the count of three is gonna go insane for you. They're gonna hoot, they're gonna holler, they're gonna clap, they're gonna celebrate. The greatest decision that any of us have ever made is choosing Jesus. So if that's you, I'm gonna count to three and I want you to get out of your seat. One, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Two, this room is gonna go nuts for you. Three, come on, can we celebrate if that's you? Would you get out of your seat and make your way up here? If that's you, would you get out of your seat? Come on, church, can we celebrate? Come on, the Bible says that all of heaven erupts in celebration. Come on. So proud of you. So proud of you. So proud of you. So proud of you. Here's, here's the next part that I'd like to do in service. I can't do a student service without praying for some lost students, some lost families. So here's what I'd like to do. If you have a student in your home who is either far away from you relationally or is far from Jesus, I wanna encourage you to get out of your seat. I'll count to three again, and this room's gonna celebrate you. But if that's you, here's what I believe. I believe before we see it, before they're sitting next to you in service, we'll pray it in together as a church. Before we see it, before they're up here, hands raised, connecting, building relationship, we will have prayed for it together as a church. 
So if that's you and you got some healing that needs to happen with a student who is far from you relationally or far from, far from Jesus, one, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, two, your family is worth a little bit of embarrassment to come get prayer. Three, if that's you, get out of your seat. Come, get, come up here and receive prayer. Come on, can we celebrate? Come on, can we celebrate? So proud of you. So proud of you. So proud of you. They're still coming. Come on, come on. God is a God of generations, right? Just because you're maybe a little bit more experienced doesn't mean God's done with you. Just because the next generation is far from him doesn't mean he's done. Here's what I'd like us to do. I'm going to pray, but church, would you pray with me? Would you extend your hands towards these up at the front? Lay hands maybe on the people around you who are in line. Can we just pray Jesus right now? We pray for the prodigal. Lord, we pray for those who are far from you. Jesus, right now, we give you all the glory. God, before we even see it, we are celebrating. We are thanking you. God, that a lost daughter, a lost son is coming back. God, that they are knitting together. Even right now wherever they are God that they are becoming aware of your presence God give them a fresh revelation of who you are and God help us as parents to forgive them God help us as family to forgive them and to forgive ourselves Jesus we love you God all of the glory goes back to you in Jesus name everyone said amen amen